Now I'm moving in on the focal point. I'm trying to decide how deep and dark I need to be in that uh, engagement of the grid. When we're talking about the grid, we're talking about the same thing that you probably see on your phone camera, where you have lines drawn a third of the way down, two thirds of the way down, a third of the way across, two thirds of the way across. And this is something that photographers use to get a good composition. The focal point should ideally be at one of the intersections along those grid lines. So we call that working the third. Well, I did bring in a little step down for the horizon here. I did a good strong lead in from the left to my focal point. But now what's bothering me is I've got that dark, you know, really donutty kind of eyeball shape there. Ironically enough, there's kind of a nose coming off to the left. Maybe it's got a little toupee on it. Uh, there's just too much imagery there. So I'm trying to, at this point, introduce some darks to see if I can get rid of that little eyeball effect. Maybe I'll be able to, maybe not. I'm going to take my huggies and again work at moving that around there. So shifting up that because the darkness almost made that little donut worse. Let's see what my next move is. Again, as I paint, everything I do, the next move is driven by the last thing I did. I'm moving down to a quarter inch brush here. That's because I could sense that I was just working too big with that other brush as I came in to address this little eyeball problem. So let's come in with a quarter inch brush. The quarter inch brush is going to allow me to impose more uh, deep, dark, controlled shape to that area. Coming in with the end of my brush and scraping through it so that it's broken up and, en and engages better with the colors underneath it. Also gives a little clue that there is more. There are layers. I do like layers. So evaluating now in the new problem, I have introduced two dots of the same mass next to each other and I've got a, a new problem. Well, what can I do? Bring in more of that same color and see how now I don't have so much of this equal mass going on between those two dots. I've also got a really nice dark next to that intense white of that almost uh, window shape that's just below it. I'm going to switch tools here. This is a Stabilo Gold. It's called a Woody's pencil and you can get these online. They come with a nice chunky uh, purpose-built sharpener and you can see that opening is quite generous. A slight pause here while I am sharpening that. I'm deliberately not sharpening it over my painting because uh, unless you want to have little shavings drop onto your painting you really should be over your waste can. I'm coming in and modifying that phthalo turquoise by adding some of this metallic gold. The consistency of these Woody's pencils is a lot like oh an eyeshadow pencil so there's a softness to it and I added a little bit of that gold going out so I got a nice strong lead in from the left. Here in the West, because we read from left to right, a good strong lead-in will help the viewer to know how to get into your painting. So it's a very compelling thing to add. And because I love balance, I'm bringing in a little bit everywhere so that the gold is not particularly intriguing in any one place. I want it just to barely show up. 
My gold is an accent color. It's also introducing warmth to this painting. So here's a little close-up of that focal point. Fairly happy with that at this point. Again, balance is important to me, and I don't like to have anything recognizable. Up in this area, I'm adding little flecks of that gold. As I, as I work on abstracts, quite often I'll do something that I call lightly abstracted so that it might be water, it might be uh, tree forms, it might be stars in the sky. I have no objection to doing this because, as you'll see at the very end of this video, I often will take these to a point of completion as a lightly abstracted landscape, scan them, and then at that point I've got a good digital copy that I can use for art prints or consumer products. Then I will live with the painting for a day or two and often change it up quite radically, and you'll see that at the end of this video. It is quite changed already from what you saw when we first started the video. I've added deeper darks, I've added uh, the gesso color, I've enriched the large teal areas that I had added to um, create some bigger shapes in the painting. One of the things that uh, can happen is you can end up with so much going on in your painting that you need restful areas or a way to offset all of that detail that you've added elsewhere. It also draws more attention to the details. So by creating these large shapes that you see now in the upper left and the upper right, you've got a, what I call the hug going on. So you've got those two shapes coming in against all of my imagery and drawing more attention to it by the absence of detail in these shapes that are making up the hug. Here's something I should have done before I did all those moves. I should have put my messy work surface underneath so that as I paint, I don't have to be so careful to uh, intrude on the part that you're seeing as nice clean background. Because I was going to shift here to adding the t d deep teal dots, I knew that I needed to bring in my messy work surface. Now the interesting thing about having a messy work surface underneath this particular one is the um, illustration board. And I like painting on illustration board. It's got, uh, it's got enough heft to it that it really seems to carry all of my layers very well. As you can see, as I do these spatters, as I do painting, as I use it as a palette, that illustration board is going to get really rich. And when I go to do my next painting, I can either cut it down to size and use it for my next painting, or create a larger painting that uh, coordinates with the smaller painting that I've just finished. All of the colors came off of this painting and um, another one that I was working with. Now see what those dark uh, teal dots did here? It's created some sense of depth. It's also integrated the teal areas into the big shapes so that they're not colliding with each other, instead they're cooperating with each other. I'm evaluating here where I need to add more of these fine teal dots. The move I just made there brought the upward thrust of imagery all the way up to the top of the painting. 
here we've reversed it and you can see it's a rising out of that lower right hand side engaging with that window shape following those steps so that step or fence area coming to the window shape and then moving out through those lines and those dots I've reached out and grabbed and created a relationship between all of that rich layering and the focal point and established where that focal point is in the painting. Reaching out to the edges of a painting is something that is very mid-century for the um, 1960s, 1950s. Particularly the California school, you'll see where uh, once they shifted to working on large canvases, they literally would reach right out and carry their colors not only out to the edges, but around the edges. That celebrates the overall footprint of the painting. It recognizes the fact that you are masterfully using the footprint that you have. Now we're all aware of the power of cropping paintings, focusing in on that focal point, putting it right where it needs to be at the engagement of the thirds. And there's nothing wrong with that, but if you can learn to paint and discern what you are doing and then deliver the paint and techniques where it needs to be, you will gain more power because your brain is then learning to think about the steps that you need to take to move that painting to a completed, finished piece of art. So here we're enjoying different views of the steps along the way that got the painting to its finished state as an abstracted landscape. And again, often I'll start working them as an abstracted landscape, but here, look at what I've done to it in the subsequent days. I've established bigger, stronger shapes, bigger, more powerful lines. I've really played up some little hints of the richness of that previous painting while driving your focus around the new painting. So we had a rise as the first painting, and this is a rise reprise. So we're looking at a rise again, and we're creating even more. It helps to look at your painting from all directions. And it's certainly fine when you think you've got it to take your school chalk draw your thirds in. You don't have to measure this. It can be a wonky third. It doesn't have to be a perfect third. But notice how the focal point is now so subtle and yet strong. This is a, a happy thing for me when we've got the darkest dark and the lightest light in that focal point. When we've got engaging small detail in that focal point when we have lines moving us into, out of, and back into that focal point. I use the chalk to figure out the flow around the painting, the balance around the painting. And now, with a light touch of the Huggies, I can come in and remove that school chalk that I used to evaluate the final abstract, get it out of the way, Looking at them up close is uh, valuable because when you get it all uh, out of focus, you can see the shapes and lines better. So if you need to, take a small painting and put it far across the room. This has been Finishing an Abstract by Kathleen Mooney. My website is KathleenMooney.com and I offer online workshops and these YouTube videos Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you looking at my art. I appreciate you following along as I finish a painting. And I hope this has been valuable for you. Thank you.